continue talking about the social self, but this time let's talk about the influence of one's culture. As I'm sure you would assume, one's cultural orientation has a huge influence on how the citizens of that culture define themselves. So for example, North Americans and Europeans, they really embrace what we call individualism. And I think you're gonna recognize these qualities right away. Individualism includes a sense of independence, self-reliance, uh, assertiveness is another really important part of an individualistic culture. And um, all of these things kind of point to what we know about America. And in general, personal goals of Americans often trump group allegiances, at least when you compare Americans to some other countries, like we will in a minute. There are some quotes that might help you better understand what I mean about individualism. I mean, we're kind of cutthroat when you think about it. We often think things like a squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's just one way to say, you know, if, if you need something, speak up. Uh, if you want something, demand it. Uh, some other quotes that help you understand what I mean by individualism would be, the only person you can rely on is yourself. Uh, look out for number one. We've heard all of these quotes before. You might have heard someone say before a quote, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And that's just another way of saying that you need to be self-reliant. Nobody's going to help you. You need to help yourself. That's a very particular way of viewing the world. And that's the way our culture is. Well, that's in stark contrast to the way that Asians, Africans, Latin Americans, how they feel. And they really embrace in their culture what we call collectivism. And collectivism focuses on some other things like interdependence and cooperation and social harmony. In general, they think what's good for the group takes highest priority. So let's talk about a couple quotes that might help you better understand collectivism. This is a pretty common quote in Asian cultures, and it always really stands out to me. A nail that stands out gets pounded down. I mean, that is, that's exactly opposite of how we feel in America. We want people to stand out. We want our children to stand out. We want them to speak up. But in Asian cultures, if you're different, you're going to get pounded down because you need to conform with the rest of the group. You're one of us. So I'm not saying one is good and one is bad. I'm simply helping you understand that different cultures have different orientations and those orientations greatly influence how we view ourselves. So this graphic gives you some idea of what I'm talking about there. When we talk about an independent view of the self, as Americans, we see the self as this distinct thing from some of our other roles, like mother, father, sibling. But in an inter interdependent view, you cannot untangle these things. My role as a mother, my role as a father, my role as a sibling, my role as a co-worker is much more entangled uh, in how I view myself. So when we talk about some of those differences, this slide right here does a good job of breaking it down. Uh, and you can always stop the video and look at this in more detail if you'd like. Let's talk a little bit more. Uh, one thing that is very interesting is that with individualistic cultures like what we have here in the United States, people are very likely to describe themselves in personal trait terms. But when you compare that with people from collectivistic cultures, like Asian cultures, they're much more likely to describe themselves in terms of the role that they play in a group. And I might have mentioned before um, a way of assessing the self-concept via what we call the 20 statements test. And that's where we're just asking people to essentially finish the statement, I am, like maybe 20 times over. And then we can get a sense of how people feel about themselves. It's a very simple test, but it's very telling in how people describe themselves. Well, if you were to give people in the United States and then maybe in some Asian cultures that same test, you'd find results that look like this. Now, this graphic isn't really pretty. I'm sorry about that. But when you look at the personal traits that people use, people in English speaking cultures are much more likely to use personal traits uh, to describe themselves compared to people in Chinese cultures. Now you can see here that personal traits are listed more than group affiliations, but people in English speaking cultures are more likely to list them than people in Chinese cultures, for example. 
But now look at group affiliations. So here's where I'd be writing down something like, I am you know, a member of a team at work, something like that. I would never write that myself, but that would be a very common response in an Asian culture. And here we can see when we code the responses in terms of being group affiliations, Chinese speaking um, cultures are much more likely than English speaking cultures to use those types of terms. So it's really pretty interesting. It, it even is found on some other really strange types of tests. This one I just find fascinating. It basically comes down to take a look at you know like this graphic right here. And you can see that there are nine different subcomponents to that graphic. What do you like best? What's your preference? And it's really kind of interesting because initially when I look at this, I think that it's kind of neat looking, but my eye really is drawn to that. And I like that sub component of the graphic best. And that's a typical individualistic response because remember, we want to be unique. Um, however, people from collectivistic cultures, they're more likely to say they like one of these other blocks, one of these other sub components. And the same is true in these other designs. So it's just kind of a strange test but you see, if we measure something in a variety of different research situations and all of these situations are pointing to the same type of result, there's probably really something there. I mean, there really is something there in terms of differences in the way that our cultures define ourselves. Let's continue to explore that for a second. This is one of the neatest studies I've ever read about. Think about like uh, some of the stereotypes, for example, how people might view themselves um, in terms of being Asian and Asian people in our culture are thought of as being usually very good in uh, analytical types of abilities like math. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, and then again, thinking stereotypically, women in our culture are often thought of as the opposite, as not being really good in analytical types of activities like math. So this provides this really interesting opportunity what if we were to study Asian females? How are they viewing themselves? And is it possible that the way they're viewing themselves at any given moment could influence their performance on, for example, a math test? So bear with me, you're gonna understand this in just a second. Let's say um, we do a study at a university that has a relatively high population of female Asian students. So. In this situation, what the researchers wanted to do was take those female Asian students and try to make some identity, whether it be female or Asian, more salient. They had three different groups. In one group, they didn't try to make any particular identity salient. In another group, they gave people a questionnaire and they tried to make the Asian identity more salient by asking them questions about um, what is life like as an Asian student on our campus? So they're responding to a variety of questions about that. They're obviously going to be thinking about themselves at that given point in time as Asian. Now imagine another group of people, again, Asian women, randomly assigned to this group where they're given the same type of survey, but now they're being asked a variety of questions about being a female on campus. So again, in this particular situation, they are very, like, very likely to be thinking themselves about themselves at that moment as females. Now, all of these women in the three groups were given a math test, and the math test was pretty difficult. And the people in the control group, where no particular identity was made more salient than another, they got about 49% of the items correct. People in the Asian identity group they got about 54% correct, so they did better than the control group. And people who had the female identity become more salient because they were asked questions about being a female, they only scored about 43% correct. And that difference that we see there between those two extreme numbers is statistically significant. It's fascinating because it shows that the self-concept is really very complex. Um, within one person, there are many different selves and the way that we view ourselves can very influence the way, very much influence the way we think and perform, as was shown in this particular study. So, what we're learning here is that the self is very influenced by one's social and cultural context. So, again, the, the self is very much in flux at times. My dog just came in the room. You might be hearing him slobbering all over me. 
All right, let's continue on here. Let's finish up. Just want to talk about one more uh, one more point, and that's social class. Social class is very much a cultural influence. What is social class? We're essentially here talking about some common socioeconomic status. So although sometimes I really hate using these terms, I mean, I would hate to identify someone as low class, but essentially we're talking about people who don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of resources. Working class, middle class, upper class. Well, think about this for a second. People who have a higher income, more education, more status, of course, they're more likely to be middle or upper class. They essentially have more opportunities to embrace an independent type of cultural orientation. And that's because they need to rely on other people less. They have all the resources they need. So they seem to be more likely to embrace an individualistic outlook. At least there's some initial research to suggest that. But now this is where it gets kind of interesting. People who have a lower income, less education, less status, they essentially have more of a need to be interdependent. It's almost like a forced interdependence. Some people might call it a hard interdependence. And that's because they need to be more reliant on others. Well, there's some research to find that they are more likely to embrace a collectivistic outlook. And of course, that's a type of outlook where um, the way you view yourself is more wound up in your group identity and how others are there to help you and you're there to help them. So even within our own culture, there is a continuum ranging from independence and interdependence. It's really quite fascinating. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.